seek out those who are seeking to fulfill their lives or deal with pain or mitigate suffering by some other God, as it were, help us, Lord, to go to them with the gospel. Help us to be zealous to proclaim Christ and, in the words of Paul, to not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Father, I pray that as the word is preached, uh, that, Lord God, we would uh, hear the, not the voice of the pastor so much as we're hearing the voice of God speaking through this imperfect clay pot. We give you the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, I'd ask you, if you would, to uh, take your Bibles and turn uh, back to Nahum again. <clears throat> and we're still in chapter 1, but we're going uh, to actually work through the entire chapter. Uh, we're in this series I introduced a couple weeks ago entitled Amazing Wrath. Uh, this is kind of an extension of that series in Isaiah 43, looking at the awe of God. Uh, and now we're kind of looking at the awe of wrath. Uh, God's wrath. And then um, after we conclude this series, I'm um, looking quite a bit down the road, uh, but we're going to look at the awe of forgiveness, uh, and we're going to preach through the epistle of Philemon. So uh, you can just jot that down, and more, more than likely that will actually come to fulfillment, all right? So unless I get some other idea. Uh, so we're going to cover this entire chapter, uh, and uh, let me just read the verses that we're going to cover this morning. Uh, there's quite a few here, but would you give your attention to it? Um, and uh, this is Nahum, and we're going to look at chapter 1, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and just read the entire chapter. I know we covered the first couple of verses, uh, but just so that we're not lost, okay? Uh, this is God's Word, Nahum chapter 1, verses 3 to 15 here. Uh, follow along in your copy of God's Holy Word. The Oracle of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum the Elkishite. A jealous and avenging God is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserves wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and the Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. In whirlwind and storm is his way, and clouds are the dust beneath his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither. The blossoms of Lebanon wither. Mountains quake because of him, and the hills dissolve. Indeed, the earth is upheaved by his presence, the world and all the inhabitants in it. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the burning of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire, and the rocks are broken up by him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who take refuge in him. But with an overwhelming flood, he will make a complete end of its sight and will pursue his enemies into darkness. Whatever you devise against the Lord, he will make a complete end of it. Distress will not rise up twice. Like tangled thorns and like those who are drunken with their drink, they are consumed as stubble completely with, uh, with excuse me, sorry, with, uh, with red from you, with or rather, <laughs> from you has gone forth one who plotted evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. Thus says the Lord, though they are at full strength, and likewise many, even so they will be cut off and pass away. Though I have afflicted you, I will afflict you no longer. So now I will break his yoke mark from upon you, and I will tear off your shackles. The Lord has issued a command concerning you. Your name will no longer be perpetuated. I will cut off idol and image from the house of your gods. I will prepare your grave, for you are contemptible. Behold on the mountains the feet of him who brings good news, who announces peace. Celebrate your feasts, O Judah. Pay your vows, for never again will the wicked one pass through you. He is cut off completely. Amen. This is God's holy word. And I'm going to break down this, these 15 verses into four sections. And these are the four sections. And you can just follow along. First of all, the certainty of vengeance. And that's actually just one verse, verse 3. Uh, the sovereignty of the Creator, which is verses 4 to 7. The severity of wrath, verses 8 to 14. And then finally, the song of celebration, verse 15. I was thinking this past week, uh, it has been a long time since I've seen the movie Patton. Uh, if you remember the movie Patton, which is um, George C. Scott, wonderful role. I think he got an Academy Award for that. Uh, but he was uh, portraying George S. Patton, one of the best-known uh, generals in World War II. Um, 
the third United States Army in France and Germany following the mm -hmm. Allied invasion of Normandy is what he's best known for. And Patton, is, if you've seen the movie, he's sort of this larger-than-life figure, okay? He is the embodiment of masculinity and courage and devotion to country, but he was also highly quotable, especially when it came to military strategy. Um, and one of the things he, he said one time about military strategy was this. He said, a good plan violently executed now is better than a perfect plan executed next week. A good plan violently executed now is better than a perfect plan executed next week. You know, perhaps Nahum could have said that uh, to Judah. Uh, that these people who are under Assyrian oppression, they're hoping desperately that God is going to liberate them, that in spite of their rebellion and idolatry, uh, that God is going to have mercy on them, He's going to annihilate their enemies. And so I want to talk about God's good plan violently executed on behalf of His people. And it is a perfect plan. Uh, because there are no flaws in any of God's plans, unlike our own. Now, I don't mean this as a, uh, a political commentary, but when you think about you know, the President and the Congress, in recent years they've not always shown the utmost wisdom when it comes to foreign policy, especially with regard to terrorism in the Middle East. But you know, we don't want to confuse uh, man's fallen human wisdom, which is tainted by sin, with God's perfect wisdom. Let me remind you that this prophecy of Nahum comes at a time when, uh, when Israel is separated into the northern and southern kingdoms, and it came long after Jonah had been sent to Nineveh. He had reluctantly preached that message of repentance. Nineveh did repent. There were conversions. There was a revival. Uh, we can imagine that Nahum in 2015 would have said, let's plant some churches in Nineveh. It's fertile. The people are getting saved. Uh, but Nineveh, like our own country, really, fell away from God. Now, I'm not suggesting that this country was ever really truly a Christian nation. I think that's kind of a misnomer because we've never been uh, universally committed to Jesus Christ. I don't know of a country that ever has. But there was a time when the church had a more influential role in the history of this country, uh, when the scriptures were more or less openly respected, when preaching the gospel was more widely accepted, but today, we are almost completely spiritually relativistic. Okay? Um, Albert Muller says this, America's rejection of a re revealed morality set the stage for this cultural revolution. Once God no longer dominated the moral horizon, personal autonomy and individual choice became the twin pillars of a debased moral worldview. I realize our hope is not in America. Okay? God is not attempting to make America the capital city of the new heavens and the new earth. Um, we, we look far beyond this country, we look far beyond any nation, but when we see what God can do to a nation like Assyria and its capital city, Nineveh, it ought to shake us out of our complacency, right? I mean, it ought to shake us. It, it should remind us that God can do whatever He wants, wherever He wants, by whatever means that He wants to any nation and to any people. Um, our disobedience, pronounced as it is today in this country, can provoke the unbearable wrath of God upon this country as much as it did with Assyria. Um, now, all of that is to simply say that Nineveh turned away from God. They oppressed God's people. Now, did God's people have some peace at this time? Yeah, they had uh, peace that you paid for, protection money. You paid a tribute, which is huge amounts of gold and silver to the king. You let the king, you swore allegiance to the king. You let the king go into Jerusalem and uh, put in Assyrian idols right there in the temple. You let the king do whatever he wants, and in return he wouldn't destroy you. Assyria had a history of corrupt and violent and idolatrous kings, but listen, according to Isaiah chapter 10, God actually raises them up and uses them as his rod of correction for his own people, and then he summarily judges Assyria. And you say, well, that doesn't seem fair. Well, keep in mind, Assyria wasn't going after uh, God's people because they wanted to you know, be in on God's plan. They were doing it because they were wicked and vile. It's just that God was using them and occasioning that for his own purposes. So he has a right to judge them. Nahum's prophecy is not about the entire ruin of Assyria. That's a massive empire that's going to fall over a period of time. 
Uh, but what it does is, by destroying Nineveh, God is setting the stage for the eventual fall of Assyria. I was trying to think of an example of this this past week, uh, maybe like Tehran. Imagine if Tehran uh, were to be destroyed, it might cause a domino effect with other terroristic states falling, so collapsing. But keep in mind this morning, and when we get deeper into Nahum, we're going to see this, that this isn't, theologically speaking, about what God did in history in one part of the world. I mean, it is part, that is part of it. But it's more than that. It's about what God is going to do to all oppressors for all of eternity when he judges all evil and utterly eradicates it. Okay? Now, let's look, first of all, at the certainty of vengeance. Look at verse 3. Nahum says that God is slow to anger. And as I said last week to our much smaller, it seems like 100 people in this room compared to last week, okay? Uh, but our much smaller congregation, faithful as they were, the remnant chosen by God, all right, we looked at God's patience with sinful humanity, and we said that God's patience is the only reason that we have not been universally damned to hell. But just because God is slow to anger does not mean that He's not great in power, right? He will, according to the text, he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. God's people need to be reminded in every age uh, that God is not unaware of evil. Sometimes people will simply say, if there is a God, why doesn't he do something about racism and genocide and terrorism and homicide? And the answer is this. He did, he does, and he will. God's word has a long history of his acting against violent oppressors. Just because he waits, just because he permits violent oppressors for a time to do their bidding, just because he uh, perhaps delays that, just because he acts in his own time and not ours, does not mean that he doesn't act. He has acted against these things by violence. He did in history, and he does today. I mean, just a more modern example, the bloody reign of Sodom the same. Coming undone in 2006. Nobody, you know, a lot of people began to think, is, I don't remember thinking this, is, is this guy ever going to go? And then in December 2006, he's executed. Well, Jesus Christ was put to death so that sinners would not be. Jesus Christ was put to death so that God can someday gather his people into a perfected creation and summarily sentence all violent oppressors to eternal hell, most notably Antichrist. The devil's bloody reign in our world, which is only because God permits it, is going to come to an end. God has acted in the past. He acted at Calvary. He's acted as we've seen here. He will act in the future. Uh, the Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, says Peter. There is a day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men that's on its way. And Judah needed to hear that the oppressors of God's people would not go unpunished. They needed to hear that even though they had rebelled against God, uh, he was still on their side and he was prepared to intercede for them. And today, we need to make it crystal clear to people that judgment is coming. Okay? It is certainly not a mere probability. It is a certainty and no one will escape it apart from faith in Jesus Christ. Well, let's move from the certainty of vengeance to the sovereignty of the Creator. Look at verses 4 to 7. And we're told that God rebukes the seas and the rivers. He is sovereign over the natural elements. It's possible that Nahum is reminding Judah of how God led them out of the wilderness across the Red Sea. He permitted their escape from Egypt. But the bigger picture here is that the natural elements are controlled by God. By the way, natural elements, um, we turn them into tourist attractions. Ancient peoples considered them fearful, uh, terrifying. For example, just take the sea, for example. Uh, if you were an ancient people and you had vacation time, you didn't say, let's schedule a holiday at sea. Because the sea was only a necessity. You didn't want to go out on the sea unless you absolutely had to. It was seen as a place of death. We turn it, of course, into a tourist attraction. But the point is, is that God is sovereign over these things, the natural elements. God is also sovereign over fertile areas of Palestine, like Bashan and Carmel. According to verse 4, He can make them wither if He chooses to. He can make the mountains and the hills dissolve. If we glance back at verse 3, it says, And whirlwind and storm in His way and clouds of the dust beneath His feet. I think that is some of the best imagery in all of Scripture, frankly. I have always loved, well I say always, I don't mean necessarily when I was three, but I mean, uh, most of my adult Christian life, I've just been fascinated by that verse. Uh, verse five, the earth is upheaved by his presence. 
Verse 6, His wrath is poured out like fire. So we can say this way, God is the God of earth, wind, and fire. He is. When God makes war, nothing can stand. Verse 6, Who can stand before His indignation or endure the burning of His anger? God is not asking humanity to, for permission for Him to be sovereign. God is not even asking humanity to acknowledge that He is sovereign. God simply is sovereign. God simply is all-powerful and He's without equal. He doesn't need permission from anyone to do anything. And Assyria is about to learn this lesson when God executes His violent plan. Thirdly, let's look at the sovereignty, or rather the severity of wrath, verses 8 to 14. And uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, we've already alluded to it, but just suffice it to say the wrath of God is overwhelming, it is consuming, and it is relentless. In verse 8, God says, He will pursue His enemies into darkness. This is kind of the language of Obadiah. Way back when, in ancient times, I preached through Obadiah. Some of you may remember, it wasn't here, it's elsewhere. Uh, but in the language of Obadiah is God tells Edom, there will be no escape. You will be reduced to stubble. You will be consumed. There will be no survivors. God's wrath is an overwhelming flood, as it was in the days of Noah. In verses 9 to 10, Nineveh is assured that whatever they try to devise against the Lord is going to fail. They're going to be like drunk men before him. In other words, they're going to be helpless. They're going to be like tangled thorns that you just cut down and you throw into the fire and you reduce them to stubble. I, I, I love to fish, but I've had two occasions this summer in which I got my line tangled up in thorns. And uh, there was one case a few weeks ago, I guess back in June at some point, but, uh, or maybe early July, but um, line got tangled in thorns and every time I was trying to pull it out, I was getting painfully stuck. And I mean like piercing the skin stuck with these thorns. And I was just getting, uh, you know, I was, I was thinking, probably thinking cuss words in my head. I wasn't saying them, okay? Probably thinking them. Uh, ben was with me, so I'm trying not to completely lose my temper. Uh, but I kept thinking, I am being humiliated by a plant. And I, no matter what I did, couldn't get it free. And when I finally did, I grabbed a big stick and I just started whacking uncontrollably whacking these thorns and just, you know, making sure that almost the entire thorn bush was falling. And I just felt like I was being victorious over evil here, you know, and just tossed it aside and just, you know, I could, I could almost hear some kind of theme song in the head, you know. But there's no doubt that Nineveh was a thorn in the side of Judah. And Satan is a thorn in our side. Is that not true? I mean, even when you're most zealously on fire for Christ, even when your prayer life is great, and you're sharing the gospel, and you're doing your family devotions, what does Satan do? He comes in and he acts over time to trip you up, to bring you down. He is like a thorn bush. The gospel promises us a day when he will be cast into the lake of fire and reduced to stubble, if you would, he, into that lake of fire that burns with brimstone. And John adds, this is the second death. They made the mistake, according to verse 13, Nineveh, of plotting evil against the Lord. This is not merely attacking God's people, church. This is attacking God. When the church is assaulted by enemy forces, it is an assault upon God, not merely upon the church. When Saul was confronted uh, as a terrorist against Christians on the road to Damascus, the voice that he heard from heaven did not say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting Baptists? It said, why are you persecuting me? You know what that tells us? God takes it personally when his people are attacked. To conspire against God's people is a sin against God himself. Okay? He takes it personally. Nineveh had become so proud and confident. You know, they had taken Damascus. They had taken Samaria. Uh, they had plundered the northern kingdom. And as one commentator said, could anyone, dare, could anyone possibly stop Assyria? Only the Lord himself. So God says in verse 12, though they are at full strength, and likewise many, I'm going to cut them off and pass away. I, I think that's great language. Cut off and pass away. It, it, it's not that God looked upon them and said, boy, they are many, but Judah did. Judah would have. I mean, you can imagine, I, you know, did they, wonder, did they wonder in their minds, can even God overcome these people? They're so successful. Could even God? And, and God says they will be cut off 
and pass away. It's very, it points to the very suddenness of the thing, doesn't it? As Kenneth Barker says, this conjures up the imagery of the death angel who passed over in Egypt. He passed over God's people and he passed judgment upon the enemies. By the way, this word for wicked, if you'll notice in verse 11, it refers to the wicked counselors. It's the word transliterated Belial. And if you know, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, when Paul talks about false teachers, he refers to them as Belial. In other words, they are worthless. They are useless. They are worthless, useless counselors. They have no moral, godly value. They are wicked. And God goes on to say in verse 13, He's going to break the shackles of His people who have been treated like oxen by these wicked Ninevites. He's going to break those shackles. He's going to set them free. Though I have afflicted you, I will afflict you no longer. Do you realize that it was God who put them into this scenario? And it was for the purposes of discipline. And, and uh, you know, But now He's going to set them free. So what can we say about God's wrath? What can we say? It's overwhelming. It's consuming. It's relentless. And we can add that it's emancipating. And we can add that it's purifying. So where do you get purifying out of this? Well, if you glance down here in the text, verse 14, it says that God is going to cut off idol and image. And he's going to issue an end to the name of Nineveh. Think about this. They had arrogantly sought to replace God's holy worship with their own. Corrupt, idolatrous worship. God says, I'm going to put a stop to that entirely. So this wrath is also a purifying force. Which brings us to the final section. And it's just one verse, verse 15. And we'll call this a song of celebration. It's a song of good news. It's a song of peace. It's a song of peace. It's a song of restoration. It's a song of assurance. Um, you know, there are many places in the Bible that you can go if you want to sing the blues. Uh, you just go to the Psalms of Lament, for example, and just read them. I mean, when you're sad, when you're really, really sad and despairing, read them because it's good for you. It's good for you to identify with a God who identifies through Christ, identifies with your own suffering. But isn't it good that not everything in Scripture is gloomy and doomy and melancholy? This is a hymn of triumph. This is a hymn of triumph. And I, I thought about this. Was it because there were already signs that Nineveh was losing its grip? Well, one of their kings had died. So possibly. You know, maybe they said, this guy's out of power. You know, it's, it's going to be God. This is a sign from God that there's going to be, that there's good news coming. Was it because of that sign? The good news, uh, possibly. But in any case, the good news is that God has announced salvation for His people. The peace of Messiah is on its way. Uh, the feasts and the vows and other forms of worship that have been severely restricted are about to be restored. By the way, there's a whole backstory to this I don't have time to get into that you can read in, uh, I think, first, uh, Second Kings talks about this. Uh, there was, there was uh, um, one king from Israel that was seeking reforms right about the same time that God is bringing in his judgment. We'll get into that maybe uh, next time we visit. But uh, God says, celebrate your feasts, O Judah. Pay your vows. Your, not your taxes to Nineveh, but pay your vows to God. So either the fall of Nineveh had already, been, had already occurred and the news had traveled to Jerusalem, or it is on its way. It's what we would call a fait accompli. In other words, it's, it's imminent. Never again, God says, will the wicked one pass through you. Now this doesn't mean, of course, that uh, Israel would never be victimized again. They would. But it means the specific people of Nineveh were about to feel the certain vengeance of a sovereign God uh, with a severe judgment uh, against these people that had bullied them for so many years, for about a hundred years. And so a song is fitting. Uh, you know, I think about this stuff. Don't you, I, I know we're not a hymnody based church per se, but don't you love hymns that are about victory, especially when they're about the cross? All hail the power of Jesus' name. Uh, Christ is risen from the grave. Uh, or perhaps this one that maybe is a little bit more obscure, but it says, and I won't read all of it, but it says, Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers arise, and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the foe and veils below, let all our strength be hurled. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory our sword, the, the, the word of God, 
with shouts of triumph trod. The faith by which they conquered death is still our shining shield. Uh, I'd like to see Lecrae perhaps rap to that. Okay? Uh, I mean, it's just great stuff, isn't it? Now, I want you to understand that this is not just a nice ending to a, you know, a, a nice story with a happy ending. When we read your name, it's more than that. This is our story. Uh, because, listen, God's plan, violently executed, is not limited to Old Testament war stories. God raised up a consortia of nations to pummel Assyria. But most, if not all of them, were just as wicked as Nineveh itself. Uh, this story it does show us the amazing wrath and wisdom of God. Uh, and we ought to be in awe of it. But it's more than that. We should be in awe of Christ. Because I want you to understand this. If you just read this in isolation, uh, you would come away from this maybe thinking, well, that's great. You know, God's loved his people and he cared for them and he emancipated them. That's true. But if you just end it with that, it's just a victory for God's people. Great. But see, it's more than that. It is God preserving his people. And that is the real victory because he sees to it that no other nation makes an end of his chosen people so that his chosen son can come out of that nation. It's more than just a victory in isolation, see. It's a redemptive victory that has echoes throughout the ages, see? It's, it, it, it's so that his son can capture the greatest victory of all at the cross, right? <coughs> that the victory that makes it possible for us to overcome the world, to overcome Satan and sin and anything raised up against the knowledge of God. We can only be victorious in the Christian life church because of the victory of Christ in Calvary, right? And this, this victory over Nineveh, the, Nin, Nin, oh, wow. this victory over Nineveh is one of many others that sets the stage for that great event. The most good and yet violently executed plan is the one that put Jesus on the cross so that your sins can be put in the deepest sea and so that Satan can be put in the lake of fire. Uh, the victory of all victories belongs to Jesus. You know, Patton also said, May God have mercy upon my enemies, because I won't. Which, you know, uh, you don't want to carry that into personal relationships. So it might be a good military strategy, okay? but personal relationships, that would conflict, of course, with the teachings of Jesus. Uh, our enemies, even ISIS, uh, any enemies, they need Jesus as much as we do, and you need Jesus as much as they do, and so do I. Having said that, God did not have mercy on Judah's enemies. And he's not going to have mercy on our enemies unless they repent. This nation, like Israel, is in red-hot rebellion against the Lord. Uh, we've seen many indications of that in recent months. And who's to say that God's not going to put this country under the same rod of oppression he put his own under? And you say, well, well why would he do that? Well, why wouldn't he do that? If you think it's because we're too good or we're too valuable, think again. So what do we want to do? We want to preach the word. We want to preach the prophecy of Christ so that this nation may be spared what it truly deserves and so that our enemies may be spared. Now let me say this one more thing before we close. Um, and this is not in my notes, uh, but 1 Corinthians 15. And I did highlight it before I came up here. And I just want to read a couple of verses very quickly and then I'll make a point and then we're done. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says of Jesus, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet, and the last enemy that will be abolished is death. Death. And then he says further on in the passage, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You say, well, what's your point? Well, it's simply this. Jesus conquers the enemy of sin. He makes us, you know, he changes us, he transforms us, he died as a substitute for us, and he is gradually, progressively removing the influence of sin from our life. So Jesus conquers that enemy. Jesus conquers the enemy of Satan. As we've already seen, he has a uh, fate in the eternal lake of fire. But sometimes we forget that there is another enemy. If we're going to talk about the victory of God, we need to talk about the enemy of death. That last enemy 
You know, of course, obviously, it may have occurred to you that this morning is the one month anniversary since Victoria was taken from us. Tomorrow, I'm preaching a funeral. I've been processing all this. I've just been thinking three funerals that I will have been to by tomorrow, uh, just this summer, just since June. And sometimes it's like that. I mean, death is all over the landscape. But do you understand that the enemy of death, the last enemy, was conquered by Jesus? Amen. Jesus' violent plan against Satan, sin, and death was perfectly executed so that we indeed have the victory. Amen. Well, we're going to see uh, in a few weeks um, later on, after Jason blesses us uh, with uh, visiting our mission statement and so forth, we're going to see how this victory prognosticated by, as it were, by the Lord, is actually carried out and how the enemies of God respond. Stay tuned for that. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we thank you. Uh, you are a God who is gracious and kind to us.